Now, the first question we have is what, what questions can I ask, Adam, to make predictions for improving service delivery, program development or fundraising? Thanks, Julia. Yeah, so um, essentially what, what, we're, what we're really driving at, um, you know, when we talk to organisations who are perhaps not quite familiar with data science and predictive modelling, um, you know, is, is really how to, how to identify the opportunities in their organisation for using predictive modelling um, and really unleashing the, the, the benefit and the power of predictive modelling for those, um, those organisations, which can be difficult, um, you know, when, you're exper when your experience and exposure to analytics has really been, you know, you might have seen some statistics cited, you know, through reports or you might have seen dashboards that are produced you know, in business intelligence uh, platforms to let you know, you know, like how your, how your sales and marketing are tracking, how your customer engagement is tracking, um, you know, what your service delivery operations and performance metrics look like. Um, and we, we have a paradigm um, for, for data and data maturity, essentially, which um, expresses a transition from uh, that retrospective uh, approach and thinking to a more uh, future focused and foresight oriented um, approach. And that's really where the predictive element of um, predictive model comes in. So um, the key question really to ask if you can boil it down to one is just, you know, what are the things that are occurring um, in your organization that, you know, are mysterious to you in some way, you know, um, mm -hmm. what are the things that occur that if you could have known ahead of time, you know, that this was going to occur, that that particular event was going to occur, uh, perhaps you could have put in place, you know, some kind of intervention or you could have done something differently that would have better positioned you to, um, to adapt to that circumstance or to react to that circumstance. So it's, um, it's yeah, really about, um, you know, what are those mysterious elements? Where could we, um, you know, where could we have done things better had we known that that was going to happen? Um, so we've got just a couple of examples that, you know, to bring that to life a little bit for people uh, I'd love to share if, if that's possible. So the first one that you can see uh, we're talking a little bit about there is um, some work that we're doing with one of our clients in uh, regional Victoria in Shepparton, Primary Care Connect, um, fantastic organisation. Um, their, their focus is helping people in the community, um, you know, who might be in need of support, uh, you know, for a variety of, um, of social issues or, or problems that they might be having. Typically, they'll be... Um, they'll be receiving people to, to engage with them through counseling services, coaching services, things of that, of that nature, where there's a conversational element taking place and over a period of time, somebody will get help. Uh, but essentially what we found was that, uh, you know, when we, when we began to engage with PCC and, and opened up their data and showed them how their, how their business was operating. Um, one of the, one of the key, um, you know, mysterious elements of their operations was, for them that uh, they had a, a very high rate of people who would, um, who would approach PCC, Primary Care Connect, who would approach PCC and say, you know, I really need help with a problem that I'm having, you know, in my life. Um, you know, I've, perhaps I've been referred to PCC through one channel or another. Um, you know, can you help me? And PCC will have that conversation with that person and say, yes, we've got a program that's really going to help you. In um, you know, let's sign you up to that program and get you back in to start having those, those um, therapeutic consultations. That program will be signed up, that person will leave, and then they'll never be seen again. And, um, and that would typically, as you'd imagine, happen for a variety of reasons. Perhaps, you know, they're having difficulty attending because of scheduling, or perhaps they've got, you know, other conflicting elements in their, in their circumstance that's making it challenging for them. But essentially, um, what we identified was an opportunity there to, uh, to make a prediction at that moment, at that first conversation, make a prediction about whether or not that individual was at a high likelihood or a low likelihood to return for, that, to, for those follow-up uh, uh, conversations and, and consultations. And so um, through predictive modeling, we were able to develop uh, essentially the, a little piece of software that is actually in development right now, um, which contains a little mathematical model and that mathematical model will take all the information that that, that clinician is, um, is able to gather about that person in that first conversation, put it through that model, and that model makes a prediction about whether or not they're going to attend. And that prediction can um, you know, be visible to that clinician and can really just provide them with a little bit of insight and intelligence in the moment 
um, about, you know, something that they would otherwise not have been able to foresee necessarily. And that's going to be, that's going to be able to prompt that clinician to be able to have a conversation in a very specific and targeted way with that individual, um, perhaps offer them some supports or services, have a conversation with them about attendance and what might be barriers for them uh, to attending that service and how PCT can support them to attend. Um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, one really sort of simple example where something's happening. We can't necessarily see ahead of time with confidence that it's, you know, what the outcome's likely to be. Um, and this is a way of using predictive modeling to really uh, shine some light on that circumstance and help uh, improve the likelihood uh, of that outcome being a positive one for PCC and for that, and for that client. So you've got some more examples there as well, Adam. Um, this one is in, in fundraising. Can you explain this to us? Yeah, so this is another really um, a classic example, uh, particularly for the not-for-profit sector um, of where predictive modeling can add great value. Um, so there are a number, of, there are a variety of heuristic models for identifying high value uh, donors. I'll just introduce a little, a little bit um, quickly before. And so, you know, in the not-for-profit sector, as, of, as lots of people will already be aware, um, fundraising is a key element to their, to their operations. So in order to continue to provide the value and achieve the mission of that organization, they need to have a strong funding stream and, um, and they'll often engage in direct marketing or direct appeals um, or a variety of other types of appeals and campaigns to their database of supporters, you know, and identifying who's likely to, re to respond the right way to the right campaign is a really important thing for them to be able to do so that they can really maximize their return on investment on those um, fundraising services. So, and as I began to say, there are a variety of heuristic uh, models that, you know, are sort of in place that some organizations use currently to, um, to, uh, to, to do that high value donor pr uh, behavioral prediction. Um, frequency, recency and value models would be a typical one. I won't go into the details, um, but, you know, some people might be familiar with those concepts. Uh, using predictive modeling essentially would be, uh, you know, the next, the next step in that evolution towards, uh, towards predicting the behavior of, of um, specific individuals. So using what we know about that individual in terms of, you know, personal details perhaps, or details about, you know, um, their behavioral history with that organization, how many uh, appeals they've received in recent history, what their donation history looks like, um, you know, how they're responding to various campaigns. We can take that information and we can generate, we can train a model, train a predictive uh, machine learning model that will make a prediction about whether or not somebody is likely to respond in the right way or in the way that we'd like to a particular campaign, um, whether over a period of time they're likely to be amongst a, a cohort of high value donors that might be the focus for a sustained campaign over a period of time. Um, you know, insights like that would be, you know, the kind of wow. really lend themselves well to, uh, to the not-for-profit sector with the fundraising can certainly see that being um, incredibly valuable um, here and all around the world. I can see that that'll be quite a popular, popular implementation, that one, Adam. And you've got one more um, example here as well that we might move on to. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is really, um, this is really an attraction opportunity for us to introduce um, a, a, an initiative, um, an innovation that we're developing here at SEER, which uh, is a data platform. Um, and this is essentially what this is, is a piece of infrastructure for the community, uh, for the community sector. So be that the not-for-profit sector, collective impact groups, um, charities, um, you know, organizations of that kind um, who might have, um, who might rely on data for a variety of their service planning, strategic planning, um, you know, service improvement or, or um, you know, activities of that kind where they'd be relying on uh, publicly available data or open data sets, they might have a need to, um, you know, compare their service, uh, their the service map with the map of, uh, you know, potential recipients of that service. Uh, so they rely on a lot of these um, data sets, but finding those data sets in the first place, making sure that they're the right ones, um, migrating those data sets into an environment where they can work with them and then having, um, you know, the, the, the familiarity with data, a comfort, a comfort and a conversance with data to be able to work with it in those environments can be really challenging. And particularly in a sector that, um, you know, isn't, isn't uh, traditionally or, or um, you know, particularly data oriented and, and mathematically, um, you know, oriented, it can be very challenging and daunting. So this platform 
uh, in its first iteration is really about making a library of, of data available to the community and not-for-profit sector. Um, core data sets of, you know, that are publicly available as the first pass, um, you know, that they can use, they can find, they can work with it inside the platform um, in a way that's very um, framework agnostic, we say. So where a lot of other platforms might be providing specific kinds of answers to questions that they want to give you the answers to. Um, our platform is really about providing a very general set of tools and techniques to find, blend, analyze data. And, and, uh, and the other core element of that platform is that it's a, it's a collaborative environment. So where you have um, a piece of work that you're doing with a piece of data, you might be able to connect another user um, to that piece of work and collaborate with them to find the right data, um, provide um, you know, some, some feedback um, you know, in the form of conversations and comments and, and, and layering uh, that analysis with local intelligence. Um, you know, perhaps we, we really, um, we're not sure about the validity or, or how uh, reliable that particular data set is in that particular year because we know, for example, that um, you know, the, the children in our community were sent home early on the day that they were supposed to be taking the NAP1 test or um, whatever that other circumstance that might have intervened might be. But on this particular other year, you know, that's a really rock solid um, year that we can really hang our hat on and, and rely on for, um, you know, for planning our services and just providing an environment where those kinds of conversations can take place um, is the sure. other part of that. Um, and in the future... Um, the platform yeah. looks fantastic. The platform looks fantastic, Adam. Um, is, it, is it currently available or is it rolling out? Uh, when is it rolling out? It's rolling out very soon. So we're going to be going into what we're calling a closed beta testing phase in, um, late in uh, this month. And then as of, um, as of the new year, uh, we'll be launching live for, uh, for anybody to sign up to be able fantastic. to um, and begin to work with it. Sorry.